Good morning. Welcome to Eliminate Your Fears and Doubts About the Science Fair Project. The Science Fair Project is that dragon in the corner of our basement, back where we keep those science teaching tools we really don't want to use. We know it's down there. We know we should do something about it. But we really, really don't want to face the idea of having to do a science fair project with our students. And right now, you probably just want me to tell you that it's okay. You can ignore that science fair project dragon, and you can stick to its easier to manage cousin, the hands-on scientific test, right? (laughs) But we're not going to do that. Instead, we're going to break down the science fair project into manageable steps. And along the way, we're going to weave in a sample student so that you can see how this process works. And by the end, you are going to be able to go down into that basement and slay the Science Fair Project Dragon, one chunk at a time. So my name is Paige Hudson, and I have literally written the book on this. (laughs) But more than that, I have walked students through doing a Science Fair Project many times, and I know that you can do this. So when it comes to uh, doing science fair projects, I had two distinct but different experiences with doing the science fair project growing up. So my first experience with the science fair project was one that I'm sure many of you can relate to. Basically, our teacher got up and she said, you're going to do a science fair project. It's due you know, in six weeks and good luck. And that was pretty much all the direction we got. So it needed to be about a scientific topic and we needed to answer a question. That was basically all the information we got about the science fair project. And so I chose a project about clouds because I was absolutely convinced that clouds had a pattern. And if I took a picture of clouds for 30 days, I would see that that pattern was repeated. Well, Honestly, if I had done a little bit of research, I probably would have figured out that that wasn't true. But I didn't do any research because I didn't know that you had to do research with the science fair project. So I went outside every day at the same time and took pictures and lo and behold, hmm, clouds didn't have a pattern. And so honestly, I didn't learn that much about science. I just got frustrated and confused and I cried many tears over doing that science fair project. And when it came around and when it came time to do the science fair project the following year, I honestly wanted nothing to do with it. But I had a new teacher, Mrs. I, and she broke the science fair project down into steps and told us what we needed to do along the way. And so because of that added direction that year, I did an experiment about plants, whether different soil types would make a difference in how the plant grew. And we're actually going to follow that project as we go through these steps. But when she broke it down step by step, I understood what I needed to do at each stage. And I was much more successful with my science fair project in general. And by the end of the project, I was much more satisfied with the experience. And I felt like I learned something about science. And I felt like there was a purpose behind doing this science fair project uh, beyond just completing the assignment my teachers had given me. So these uh, steps that my husband and I have developed are somewhat are loosely based on my experience with Mrs. I and the science fair. So before we dig into those eight steps, we're going to talk about uh, why and when you should do a science fair project with your students. Um, First of all, why we bother with doing a science fair project is because it gives our students a chance to see the scientific method from start to finish in a way that nothing else we do can. We can do hands-on Uh, experiments, we can do demonstrations, we can do nature study with our students, and yes, it will present uh, the face of science to our students, but as far as using the scientific method from start to finish, the Science Fair Project is the best tool we have to introduce our students to what it's like to go through the scientific method. So that's really why we should bother uh, with doing a Science Fair Project And when should you do one? I generally recommend that you hold off on doing a science fair project until about fifth grade. 
because by the time they hit fifth grade, our students have built up their knowledge base enough to develop a question for their science fair project and to be able to um, develop that hypothesis that they have or to make an informed guess about the answer to their question to do the research that's necessary and just to be able to do all the steps. The science fair project is a big assignment. And so I generally like to wait until about fifth or sixth grade for uh, to assign a science fair project to my students so that they have the skills that they need to complete the science fair project. So of course, a science-minded child can continue to do science fair projects every year from middle school through high school if they enjoy them. Um, but I recommend that you do at least one science fair project with your students during the middle school years. So I've mentioned the scientific method a few times. Let's go through uh, the steps of the scientific method so we'll understand what the scientific method is that we're guiding our students through. So the scientific method is really a method that helps uh, scientists examine and observe. The scientific method is a process that scientists use to examine and observe before making a statement of fact. A scientist wants to approach a question analytically. They want to gather information to learn about the subject and to do some tests before they are making a statement of fact because we want to be able to back that fact up with information. So the first step is to ask a question. So a scientist will observe an, an occurrence or something that makes them wonder what is going on behind it. And they'll create a question that they are asking. So the second step in the scientific method is to do a little research. So the scientists will research the topics surrounding it, will gather information to see if anybody else has done this test before. It, if anybody else has had this question before, if they've done experiments or tests around this question that we have, and learn a bit of background information about the subject matter, because this will give us the basis for formulating a hypothesis. And it also keeps us from repeating mistakes of that from the past. So we'll ask a question, we'll do a bit of research, and then we're ready to make a hypothesis. And that's step three. And so in step three, we'll formulate that hypothesis, which is an educated guess. Okay, so a hypothesis isn't just a guess at something, it's an educated guess. We've got a background of information um, from which we will make a guess at what the answer to the question is. And this hypothesis will be able to be measured. So it's best if it's a simple if-then statement. And it'll be around a sentence long. So once we have this educated guess of the answer to our question, we'll do an experiment. So the scientist will develop an experiment that will test his or her hypothesis, and they'll have more than one sample in there so that we can uh, verify the results, and they'll only change one variable at a time, again, so that our, our results will be reliable. So then in step five, they'll look at those results. Remember, observations are things that they see and results are things that you are specific and measured. So they'll look at their diary or journal that they've kept throughout the testing and they'll look at the data that they got back from the testing and they'll analyze these things to draw conclusions. And that's the final step. So we've asked a question, we've done some research, we have came up with a hypothesis, and we've used an experiment to test that hypothesis. We've analyzed the results that we've gotten, and now we're going to draw a conclusion. And the scientists will use all the discoveries that they've made along the way to make a statement about uh, their question. And this communicates their results. And if they found that their hypothesis is false, uh, the scientists will go back and design another experiment to test their hypothesis or maybe come up with another hypothesis and test that one. And the procedure goes on and on and on until we can make a, a verified um, theory about the answer to our question. And then other scientists will come along and they will test it and see if they can replicate our results before scientists as a community feel like, yes, we can make a statement of fact about uh, this specific question. Does that make sense? So that's the basis of the scientific method. And we're going to use that process as the basis of our science fair project. 
So the science fair project will follow uh, the six steps of the scientific method, and then we'll add in two more steps for a presentation because we want to share and communicate our results, okay? So let's dig into how we begin. Step one, we are going to choose a topic. So we start at the beginning. We need to come up with a topic for our science fair project, right? So when we pick this topic, we want to capitalize on our students' interest. So you want to have your students uh, brainstorm about topics that interest them. And then you want to have them uh, rank those areas by degree of interest and have them choose which area they're actually going to focus their project on. So when I did my science fair project in seventh grade, I was interested in things like plants and animals. And I was also interested in light bulbs and magnets. But for my project, I chose that I wanted to do something relating with plants because at that time, plants were the most interesting to me. But plants is kind of a broad topic, so we needed to kind of narrow that down, what specifically interested me about plants, and to come up with a topic for my project. And for that, it was the growth of plants. So if your student has, uh, if their topic is too broad, we need to kind of narrow it down a little bit that will be so that they'll be able to choose or to develop uh, questions about it, which will be the next thing we do in choosing a topic for the science fair project. We're going to develop a question about that area of interest that they picked. You need to remind your students that good questions begin with how, what, when, who, which, why, or where. So basically you'll say to them, now that we've determined the area of science we want to learn about, let's think of some questions that we could answer about that subject. So if my topic was the growth of plants, I could use questions such as, why do plants grow? How fast do plants grow? When do plants grow? And which plants grow faster? Okay, so once you have a few questions around the topic that they picked, you're ready to choose one of those topics to be the main question. You will analyze the questions that they came up with and you want to know a question that's not uh, too broad, but that will be specific enough that they can develop a test around it. So if I chose why do plants grow? Well, that's really broad because sunlight, water, and nutrients, these all affect plant growth, not to mention uh, the weather and a whole host of other factors. That question would have been too time consuming to do an experiment about. So you could narrow it down to, you know, how does the lack of sunlight affect the growth of houseplants? Uh, which soil is best for houseplants to grow in? Those are more specific, making it easier for our students to measure. So basically, in this first step of choosing a topic, we're going to pick something that interests our students. We're going to narrow it down by asking some questions about that topic, and then we're going to narrow those down even more to choose a question that is specific that we can test with an experiment. So through that process for our sample project, we've chosen the question, which soil is best for houseplants to grow in? So now that we've narrowed it down to a question, we're ready to move on to the second step, which is to do some research. So we have our topic, and now we need to learn some more about it. We need to give ourselves some background information so that we can develop our hypothesis and design a good experiment. So the first thing we're going to do, we're going to brainstorm from for some research categories. So this will help our students uh, take a more focused approach to their research. And they should have uh, at least three categories that they can research, but no more than five, as this will help them. This will make it a bit easier for them to write their research report as a part of the science fair project. So for example, in my project, which soil is best for houseplants to grow in? I came up with the topics of uh, what is found in soil. Uh, plant growth in general, like how do plants grow, uh, information about plant structure, and the different types of soil. So I had these research categories, things for me to look at when I went to the library. So now that I had these categories of information that I wanted to find, it's time to hit the library. 
Of course, you can choose to do to allow your students to do research on the internet, or you can just have them use the resources that you already have on your shelf at home. That's a great thing about being a homeschooler. We have multiple options. Um, so wherever they choose to do their research, I love uh, to use what I call the index card system. So as they find key facts, basically you'll take an index card and you'll assign each research category a number. So the types of soil would be category number four. Does that make sense? And then when you find a reference, you'll create a master reference list and assign those a letter. So for instance, I'm, I don't know, doing research from the Kingfisher Science Encyclopedia about plant structure, right? So plant structure is my third category. I'm going to assign the Kingfisher Science Encyclopedia my reference A, and then I'm going to put one piece of information on my index card. So on this index card, I'm going to have that one piece of information in the middle. In the left-hand side, I'm going to put a number three for my research category, and then I'm going to put a letter A in the right-hand side uh, for my reference letter. Okay, does that make sense? So that's how we do the index card system. And this makes it super easy for when we hit the next step uh, for organizing the research that we've done. Basically, you will take these index cards and organize them into uh, an outline of sorts for your research paper. So you'll go through each fact and you'll determine, you'll have the student go through each fact and determine five to seven of the most relevant from each category. So you'll sort all your index cards into the uh, three to five categories that you have. And then you will uh, determine, you know, five to seven to create this research report. And the great thing about this is because you've written the reference letters, you know exactly which references to include in your work cited report. So they've got these index cards and they've created this basically an outline for a report and then in the last part of their research, they will write a short report about what they found out, okay? So using the index card system makes it easier for them to organize and write this report in their own words, of course. So once we have some research, the students are ready to formulate their hypothesis. So at this point, our students have chosen a topic, they developed a question that they want to learn more about, and they have done some research, and now they are fully prepared to formulate a hypothesis. Because now that they know a little bit about the subject, they're ready to make an educated guess about what the answer to their question is. And that's basically what a hypothesis is. It's an educated guess at what an answer to the question is, okay? So the first thing that we want to have our students do is to review their question. So we want to make sure that everything that they've done up until this point is fresh in their minds. So we can review our question. We're going to have them review the research and then they're going to make an educated guess. They're going to formulate this hypothesis and their hypothesis should be a simple if then statement. Okay, so you want to guide them to craft an if-then response to their question. So, for example, let's go back to my plant project, which was, which soil is best for plants to grow in? So my hypothesis could have looked like this. If a plant is grown in potting soil, then it will grow much faster. Or I could have said, I believe that plants growing in potting soil will grow better than plants growing in other types of soil. Okay, so that's my hypothesis. I believe that potting soil will be the best soil for a plant to grow in. Okay, so once they have their hypothesis or their educated guess of what the answer to the question is, we need to move on to step four, which is to design an experiment that will test whether or not their hypothesis is true. And this step is patterned after the fourth step in the scientific method. And remember, we talked about how our scientists will change variables and they will also have multiple samples in their test to make sure that their results are verifiable, okay? But we'll only change one variable at a time and we'll always have a control group. 
Okay, so we need to keep those things in the back of our mind. And the first thing we're going to do is to have our students start to brainstorm from, for some possible ideas. So ask them things like, what kind of test could you use to answer your question and prove your hypothesis, either true or false? And then have them write down uh, these ideas. Some of them will be great. Some of them will be crazy off the wall, and that's fine. Right now, we're just trying to do kind of a brain dump of all the ideas that we could use. So, for instance, um, with a plant project, I could write down, uh, I could have grown a whole bunch of different plants in sand to see which one would grow the best. Or I could grow one type of plant in several types of soil to see which would grow the best. Or I could grow several different types of plants in different kinds of soil to see which one would grow the best. Okay? So once you have a list of just all the possible ideas, we're going to go through and analyze which one is the best one. So, for instance, the first idea that I came up with uh, wouldn't be a very good one because there's nothing in it about potting soil. So I can't really test if my hypothesis is true, which had to do with potting soil, right? So the third option takes care of the problems uh, that were in the first one as far as it's going to test different types of soil. But it's also going to test different kinds of plants, which will be uh, very involved. That would be a good project for a high schooler to do where there'll be multiple steps, but not necessarily the best experiment for your first science fair project. So really the best test would be the second one where I'm looking at one type of plant in several different types of soil. Okay, so I know that that's going to be the basic design of my experiment. Now I need to go back and determine the variables that are going to be involved in in my experiment. So there's three main types of variables at play in any experiment. And that's the independent variable, the dependent variable, and the controlled variable. Okay, and we need to have all three of these in our science fair project. So the independent variable is going to be the factor that is controlled or changed. The dependent variable is going to be the factor being tested in the experiment. Okay, and then a controlled variable is anything that we need to keep constant. So you're going to ask yourself three questions, or your student's going to ask themselves three questions. Number one, what factor am I trying to test? This will give us the independent variable. Number two, what factor will I use to measure the progress of my test? That is our dependent variable, because it's dependent upon something, right? third question you need to ask is what factor or factors do I need to keep constant in my experiment so that they don't affect my results and these are control variables okay so you answer these three questions to determine the variables in your science fair project so for instance with our sample project about one type of plant in several different types of soil my independent variable is going to be the type of soil Okay, so that's the thing that I'm changing in my test, right? My dependent variable, this is going to be how I'm going to measure the effect of the, the change, is going to be the growth of the plant. So how much the plant grows, which is dependent upon the type of soil. Does that make sense? Okay, and then the control variable uh, I'm going to have a lot in this experiment. Uh, the sunlight, the amount of sunlight they receive, so I want to make sure they're all in the same place getting the same amount of sunlight. The amount of water, so I want to make sure I'm giving them the same amount of water each day. The size of the pot, they should all be planted in the same size. The type of grass that I'm going to use, or the type of plant, will be a control variable. And the nutrients, uh, that I feed the plants. So if I decide to give them a bit of miracle Grow, I need to make sure that I give the same amount to each plant. Okay, so those are the control variables. So once we have our variables written down, so we've decided on a test, we've determined the variables that are going to be in our test, now we're ready to sit down and actually plan out the experiment. Okay, so the student is going to need to write out a plan. And I know this seems like a lot of prep work, but all this prep work will make the rest go so much easier. So they write out a plan, They're going to, and their plan should include uh, what they're going to do, uh, what they need, and how long it will take. In my experiment, I'm going to have a control group with a six-inch pot 
uh, with soil from the backyard. Then I'm going to have a test group with a six inch pot uh, in potting soil. And then I'm going to have a test group, which is a six inch pot in sand. Okay. So I'm going to come up with a plan. So basically my plan for my science fair project is I'm going to get, you know, maybe between six and nine pots and I'm going to do two to three of each type of soil. Then I'm going to put the same amount of grass seed in each one. I'm going to place them in the same place so they get the same amount of sunlight. I'm going to set a watering schedule for them to make sure that they get watered at the same time and I'm going to feed them at the same time. Once I've noticed that they've sprouted, I'm going to start recording measurements of the growth until uh, for two weeks and then we'll compare the results, okay? So basically, <clears throat> so I know that if my grass seed takes um, five to seven days to germinate, I need, and I'm going to measure my growth for two weeks, I need to plan out at least three weeks for my experiment, okay? So once I have uh, some notes, once I have notes laid out with my experiment plan, I'm ready to go back and review my hypothesis. So I want to read over my hypothesis and make sure that my experiment design is going to uh, determine whether or not my hypothesis is true. Okay. So you may just ask your students a couple of times, if you got this results from your experiment, would it answer, you know, would it prove your hypothesis true or false? Would it answer your question? Okay. So you can do this a couple of times just to make sure that the experiment you've designed is going to uh, test your hypothesis and answer your question. So we've got all this prep work done and this is going to help uh, our experiment go smoother because we paved a smooth road for our experiment. So step five is for us to actually do that experiment. And the first thing we're going to do is have our students get ready. So they're going to gather all their supplies. They're going to make a checklist of the things they need to do while the experiment is going on and block out the time for that. I need to look at the calendar and make sure I'm going to be home for the next three weeks to be able to watch and measure the growth of my plants. I'm going to need to make sure that I have uh, the three different types of soil. I'm going to make sure that I have my nine pots, my grass seeds, so I can get started. And then I'm going to uh, make sure that I have a checklist of things that I need to do. Sa a sample checklist for my project is that I need to take pictures of the plant every day. I need to make daily observations in my journal. I need to measure any results once the grass begins to grow and I need to check the soil for moisture content just in case I need to add water to make sure that the plants are being adequately watered. And then I need to rotate the pots uh, from front to back or side to side to make sure that they get an equal amount of sunlight, okay? So I've got my checklist, I've got my supplies, I've blocked out the amount of time for my science fair project and I'm ready to actually do my experiment. So I'm going to run the experiment. Make sure you take pictures each day because you'll be able to use these pictures for your science fair project board. So you want to record your observations and your results as you go along. Now, observations are the things that you see happening. So this is like a journal or a diary. And then results are specific and measurable. So when I record my observations, uh, an observation could be like on day eight, the grass in the pots from test group one and the control group finally sprouted. The pots in test group two look like they might sprout tomorrow and I had to water the pots in test group one today. Okay, so it would just be a daily uh, journal of the observations. Then once they start growing, I'm going to actually have results in which I'm going to say, Test group one grew one inch. Test group three grew three inches. Okay, so those would be the difference between observations and results. And we're going to record those throughout our experiment because we need both observations of what we've seen and results that are specific and me measurable for step six, where we're going to analyze the data that we've collected from our experiment. So step six is really the time for us to figure out what our experiment has told us. 
So the first thing we're going to do is review and organize all the data we've collected. Again, there might be time between when your experiment is finished and when you're actually doing this analysis and putting together uh, your analysis and your conclusion in the next step for your science fair project. So we want to start the process by reviewing and organizing the information we've collected. So we're going to read over our journal entries and note any trends in these observations that we've made. Then we're going to take our results and create any charts or graphs using that. So for instance, with the plant growth, what we'll do is we will create a graph that shows the growth of the plants. So we'll put in all the data points for on day 10, we measured test group one at one inch, test group two at two inches, and test group three at one and a half inches, okay? So we'll put in those data points and we'll it'll spit out a graph for us. So we'll have these graphs or charts from our results and we'll have our journal observations and we'll note any trends from that. And so as I looked through my journal for my project, I saw that all of the plants were healthy throughout the test. That's a good thing. So I also noted that the grass in test group one appeared to grow quick, quicker than the one in test group two, and that the pots in test group two were watered more frequently. So those were the observations that I noted. And then I also recognized that from my results, I could see clearly on the graph that group one grew the best and that group two grew better than the grass in the control group. So now I've got some good solid analysis from reviewing my observations and my results, and I can go ahead and state whether or not I proved my hypothesis true or false. I wanna go back and say and craft a one sentence statement, starting with I found that or I discovered that in order to be able to communicate my results. So for instance, after I've looked at the analysis of my observations and my results, I was able to state the answer to my question is, I discovered that grass in my experiment grew best in potting soil, okay? And you want to include in the statement I discovered and in my experiment, because we're making a statement about our results and our observations. We're not necessarily making a statement of facts such as grass grows best in potting soil because there's lots of other factors and trials and tests we need to run to be able to make a blanket statement that grass grows best in potting soil. So we wanna make sure that our statements, our, our answers, uh, reflect the fact that this was something we found in our project, okay? so. In the case that you did prove your hypothesis false, normally a scientist would go back and formulate another hypothesis and start the whole process again. Um, for the case of a science fair project, you just need to decide, do you have the time to do something like that? If you do, great, go ahead and, and go back and do it again. If you don't have the time for it, in your conclusion, you just wanna say, we proved our hypothesis false. Here's what I think the answer might be, but additional testing would be needed to prove whether or not this is true, okay? So once we've got all this information in our hands from our students and all this analysis, uh, we wanna write a concluding paragraph. So draw several conclusions about the science fair project. And in this conclusion, you should include uh, the answer to your question that you had in the beginning, whether or not your hypothesis was true, proven true or false. And if so, you need to talk about why. Any problems or difficulties you had with your experiment, uh, anything interesting you discovered that you want to share, and ways that you'd like to expand the experiment in the future. So that's what should be included in the conclusion for your science fair project. So we've done a lot of work up until this point. At this point, the students have gone through the six steps of the scientific method. But the final two steps of the science fair project give our students a chance to share what they've learned and what they've done along the way with other people. So step seven is going to be to create a science fair project board. So this is gonna be the visual aid for their science fair project presentation. So it's important to be eye-catching and attractive. And remember back in step five when I said, make sure you take pictures, that was for this science fair project board. So we're moving from the scientific method into sharing our results. And the first thing we're gonna do is to plan. So 
we're going to plan out the pieces that should be on their science fair project board. And this is going to be easy because we've already done a lot of prep work all throughout. So basically, a uh, science fair project will look will look like what you see here in the slide. In the center, we're going to have the title. And then below that in the center section, we're going to have uh, more information about the experiment. So your materials, uh, your procedure, a uh, photo collage of what you did, graphs and charts of your results should all be there in that center section. Because that's going to be what's going to be the most eye-catching part of the project. So we want to make sure that's front and center. And then on the left, we want to put things like the introduction, the hypothesis, and any research we had. And then on the right side, we want to talk about our results and our conclusions because we want to draw people in with our science fair project and then they can read more about it as they look at it. So we're going to plan out uh, where these different pieces are going to go, what kind of pictures we're going to use, and how we're going to create some visual aids with it. So not just simple text, but maybe we're going to put construction paper behind that uh, so each of the sections stands out. Then we're going to prepare the materials. So we've written out our introduction. We wrote out our hypothesis. We wrote out our research. Uh, we may need to type those different sections out and get them ready. We need to cut out any parts uh, that are going to go on our science fair project board. And then we put it all together. So it's a beautiful visual aid for step eight, which is to give our presentation. And I really highly recommend that you have your students do these two steps. I know that doing a science fair project at home, we don't always necessarily have a huge science fair to participate in, although many of the county science fairs will allow homeschool students to submit projects. So you need to check with your county to see if your student can do that or not. Even so, uh, it's still worth doing a presentation or having our students do a presentation to their siblings, to their grandparents. Uh, if you have a co-op, to do a co-op together where people are doing these science fair project presentations because the process of preparing and sharing is valuable for our students to do. So in step eight, they're going to give their science fair project presentation. They're going to prepare it. They're going to practice it. And then they're going to share it with a group of family members or at the local library or with your state science fair if they can. When they prepare their talk, writing an outline of it with uh, bullet points so they'll know what highlights to hit. Their talk should basically be a walk through their science fair project board. So they're going to talk about their question that they came up with. Um, they're going to talk about their hypothesis that they had. They're going to share maybe one or two pieces of their research and then talk about how they designed their experiment, what they found out, and the conclusions that they came up with. Okay, then they're going to practice that. I hated to give speeches <laughs> because I was nervous to get up in front of people. So my mom would always have me practice my speech in front of a mirror because I tend to talk a lot with my hands which you probably have noticed. And having that practice, you know, practicing the talk in front of the mirror uh, helped me to see when my hands were distracting and when they were helpful to the talk. Okay, so practicing it in front of a mirror is good experience. And then also practicing it in front of the stuffed animals or in front of if you're going to give it at a local science fair, you might want to also practice it in front of your siblings or your parents or something like that. Okay, so practice it a whole bunch of times because then when you actually go to give the talk, it will be so firmly entrenched in your memory that your nerves won't get the best of you. Okay, and then when you share the presentation, uh, make sure your students arrive on time for their presentation, that they give plenty of time to set up their presentation board. You may also want to include a few materials on the table in front of it from your project and then give the talk and be prepared to answer any questions. If your students have done their project from start to finish, answering any questions won't be that difficult. Always have them end the time by thanking whoever was willing to come and listen to the presentation. So that is your science fair project from start to finish in eight easy steps. 
And then I want to, before we wrap things up and take some questions, I just want to talk about a few additional things that you need to consider when you're doing a science fair project at home. For your high schoolers, you want to do uh, projects that are a little more complex and have multiple tests. Remember, we talked about in the plant project how uh, you could test different plants along with testing different soils. So basically, you would test the different soils, determine which soil was the best, and then take that soil and test several different types of plants to see if that really made a difference. So your high schooler is going to have multiple different tests. Um, and then you also need uh, certain states. If you're going to enter into a state or local science fair, you need you might need to consider having a supervising scientist if you're doing projects with humans or animals because they can help you design an ethical test. And then you also need a supervising scientist if you're using hazardous or controlled substances. For example, our daughter was really enjoyed the experiment where you use lemon juice to remove copper ions from pennies and then plate them onto iron nails. And she wanted to test whether or not the strength of the acid uh, would make a difference in how the copper plating worked. So for her project, she needed to use some really strong acid. So in that case, she needed to have a supervising scientist or somebody who knew how to properly handle and dispose of the acids. So if certain projects will need supervising scientists, especially if you're participating with the state and local fair. And when you look into the state or local fair, they will give you the uh, parameters for what requires a supervising scientist. The other thing we want to talk about is ethics. We can boil ethics down to do not cause harm. So there are low and there are high risk projects. So a low risk project to your human or animal subjects would be um, how music affects memory. So observation or behavioral projects. So you're observing certain behaviors in your subjects. And these are considered low risk as long as we give them positive rewards and there's no stress involved in the project. So those are low risk projects and those would be ones that ethically would be okay to do. A high risk one would be a food project because we could run into issues where people have uh, gluten intolerance or peanut allergies that maybe they weren't aware of. And if we're doing some kind of food project that presents that, that's a very high risk project. If there's high stress to our subjects, things like uh, the effect of acid rain on goldfish, uh, you're going to lose a lot of goldfish in the process of this project. So that would be a high risk project and we definitely need a supervising scientist to determine whether or not that project would be okay. I ran across a student who wanted to test whether or not cats always landed on their feet and their idea for their project was to drop a cat from three foot, six foot, nine foot, and 12 foot to see if the cat landed on its feet. Ethically speaking, maybe not the best project to do for your science fair project. So that's something where, you know, a very high risk of injury to our test subject is possible. Um, and ethically, we really don't want to do projects that involve a high risk of damage to our, or a high risk of harm to our test subjects. We'll leave that to scientists in the lab who have a lot more oversight and a lot more control. So you want to keep your risk low. Don't cause any harms to your test subjects. Okay. And if you are using human or animal test subjects, you always need to include a statement explaining your ethical treatment. So in other words, how you protected your test subjects from harm. Hazardous chemicals. We always want to dispose of those properly. So if you're not sure how to dispose of a chemical properly, ask. And then in your project, you need to, if you do use a hazardous chemical, you need to make sure that you explain how you disposed of it and rationalize your use of using them. For instance, in our daughter's plating project, she described how she used baking soda to neutralize the acid before disposing it and then also explained why it was necessary for her to use a higher concentration of acid in her project, okay? So those are the kinds of things that we need to consider when doing a science fair project. 
I want to thank you all for coming. I hope that you can see that through these eight steps, it is possible to do a science fair project at home. And I want to encourage you to do at least one with your students in their homeschooling career. If you want to know more about doing a science fair project, or if you have questions, you can find me down in the elemental science booth. And of course, we have copies of the science fair project, a step-by-step -step guide with us down in the booth. So come down and visit us there. Thanks again for coming.